fun and keep the conversation going. If you could uh, use the hashtag UBI Wales, that would be fantastic. Let's get it trending. There we are. We'll just give it uh, another minute or two and we'll, uh, we'll get into it and introduce our panel. For anyone who's just joined, who hasn't heard this already, if you could um, just let us know where you are in the country by changing your name or adding it to the end of your name, I should say, that would be really helpful. Okay. Doesn't look like we've got anyone else in the uh, waiting room at the moment, Johnny. Am I? I think that's Where everyone in, and we're we're live to to YouTube now. So whenever you're ready. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and thank you uh, for joining us tonight. I'm Kieran. I'm from UBI Lab Wales, and I will be your host this evening. So just to let you know, I know we've just talked about it, but tonight is recorded. We're live on YouTube, and what I just really like to promote really is this is meant to be in conversation so if we could just try and engage in the chat as much as possible uh, the UBI lab network team are there and hopefully they will be able to answer your questions and they'll also be able to copy links in as well um, and if you will uh, or if you're going to try and put a few tweets out tonight if you could just use the hashtag UBI Wales uh, that'd be brilliant now pleased to announce we're in conversation tonight with the Welsh Liberal Democrats, which is the second in our series of events leading up to the Senate elections in May. Now we have four candidates from the Welsh Liberal Democrats joining us this evening. We have Jane Dodds, Nina Farhat, Rhys Taylor and Oliver Townsend. Just like to say really thank you for joining us. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you here this evening. Now I will hand over shortly. Before I do, just to give you really a brief insight into who we are. So. UBI Lab Wales, we are a campaign group calling for a basic income or a universal basic income pilot here in Wales and, of course, the, the wider United Kingdom. In Wales, we currently have council motions passed basically calling for a basic income pilot in Swansea, RCT, or Rhondda Cynantaf, and Gwynedd. Uh, the leader of Cardiff Council has also called upon the Welsh Government to trial a pilot in Cardiff, which is most of the way there. The Senate last year also passed a motion advocating for trial. We'd like to think we had a, a little bit to do with that. Now, what is a UBI for those who are new to the concept? Um, a UBI is basically it's a regular, unconditional cash payment paid to every individual. And it's designed to cover an individual's basic needs. And I think if you break poverty down to its most basic elements, you know, poverty is a lack of cash. Um, and a UBI would help solve, you know, basic income would help solve that immediate problem. And in short, we at UBI Lab Wales believe this could be our generation's NHS. And, you know, hopefully in 10 to 20 years time, we could look back at UBI in the same way we, you know, we look at our NHS now. Now, before I pass to our wonderful panel, I just wanted to plug our campaign, just say that we're basically running this campaign in the lead up to the Senate elections, calling on all candidates to back our motion in support of the UBI pilot. Um, delighted to announce that we have 92 signs so far. Um, to be honest, it's, yeah, it, 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 we're over the moon. Um, now the network team will place a link in the chat where you can sign up as an individual, basically calling on your local candidates to sign the pledge. Uh, please retweet, share it, talk about it, talk to your family, your colleagues. You know, what we need now is to get UBI into the consciousness, the public consciousness. We need to keep the conversation going. What I'll do now is hand over to our candidates just a briefly 30 seconds, 60 seconds to introduce themselves and we'll jump straight into the conversation. So firstly, over to you, Jane. Thank you very much, Diego Marianne Osweitha. And can I say a huge thank you to UBI Wales. Uh, you're amazing people. You do this completely on a voluntary basis and we're very grateful to you. Thank you very much, Diego Marianne, for bringing us together. Uh, so my name's Jane Dodds. I'm the leader of the Welsh Liberal Democrats. I'm also leader of the UBI Liberal Democrat group who pushed through the motion to our uh, national party. 
Uh, and, you know, we are the first of the top three parties to actually introduce a policy of universal basic income. And I'm incredibly proud of that. But we've got more to do. Critically here in Wales, um, my view is that we need to look at a trial of universal basic income and we need to do that working with the other parties. But I look forward to hearing the conversation and the ideas this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lina? Hi, yeah. So my name is Lena Farhat and I am a candidate with the Welsh Liberal Democrats. Um, I have been selected to fight Clyde South, which is the North Agency, and I am really passionate about, um, well, economics, but actually economics within um, rural seats and also how it impacts um, equalities. Um, I am a self-confessed um, UBI sceptic. Um, but I have actually signed the pledge um, because I think a trial is really, really important. Um, but I am slightly here to be convinced, even by my own party. And that's the joy of being a Welsh Lib Dem. We're allowed to, we're allowed to have these discussions. Fantastic. Thanks, Lena. Hopefully we can uh, go some way to convince you tonight. And Rhys? Yeah, Diolch Bawb. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, so my name is Rhys. I'm, I'm a councillor in Cardiff and I'm leader of the Liberal Democrat Group on Cardiff Council uh, and a candidate for Cardiff North in the Senate election. We tried desperately as the Lib Dem group to get a motion over the line in Cardiff, but for some reason Cardiff's rules uh, on motions appear to be slightly out of kilt with the rest of the country, which meant that we had to do, make do with a letter from the, the leader of the, um, of the council, which um, nonetheless make, makes the point. Um, but yeah, looking forward to the conversation and thank you for the invitation, Diolch. And finally, over to Oliver. Hi, uh, good evening. Um, my name is Oliver Townsend. I'm the candidate uh, for Isloin in South Wales East and also on the regional list. So uh, lucky people in that area get to vote for me twice. Um, I'm here to um, really share my perspective as um, someone who's grown up with a disability, um, but lucky enough not to have to rely on uh, benefits or welfare. Um, so I want to talk about some of the sort of inhumanity that's in our welfare system that I think uh, UBI, a uh, basic income, would really help people uh, overcome. Uh, so I hope that comes up today as well. And if it doesn't, I'll make sure it does. <laughs> Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Oliver. Well, on that point, we're going to go into uh, some questions, but hopefully at the end we'll have time for the for the audience to put some questions in. So. Um, Without further ado, we'll, we'll go into the questions, but it's all about having a conversation um, and trying to keep it as free flowing as possible. So for the first question, I'm gonna to go to you, Jane. Uh, why have Liberal Democrats adopted UBI or universal basic income as a party policy? Oh, I think there's many reasons, um, but I'll just talk about why I've been uh, kind of pushing this. And can I just start by saying, that five years ago, somebody mentioned the concept of universal basic in income to me. And I thought, what a ridiculous idea it was. I thought they were mad. I just thought it was just ludicrous. But actually I read up more and more about it. I looked at the trials and the pilots. And I guess for me, the big thing is that if it stops people going to food banks, that's enough, really, that is enough for me. And I guess, you know, the Liberal Democrats have always been a party that have looked at social justice and we've always looked at the idea that people should have the freedom to choose. They should have the resources to be able to make the choices that they want in life. And having a basic income, having something that comes in every week, something you know is going to come in. Um, that you know is going to feed your family, that you know is going to give you the opportunity to care for somebody or have the choice to perhaps be an entrepreneur or to do something different, um, I think is, is naturally liberal um, with a small L. So that's, I think, um, you know, one of the reasons why we've been pushing for it. Uh, be, be, be clear. There are many, many people in the Liberal Democrats and in the Welsh Liberal Democrats who have reservations about it, and I totally understand that. But, um, you know, let's let's just keep the conversation going, because that's how I changed. Uh, so, yeah, looking forward to hearing views. Yeah, thank you, Jane. And, you know, I, I completely agree with you. Um, I think one of the benefits to a, a UBI is the emancipatory effect that it can give. Um, and so it's that freedom of choice. And I think what COVID has shown us is that 
there is the support available and we can support you know, the public at large. So thanks, Jane. Lena, do you want to come in on that question? Yeah, sure. So actually, um, I think that the reason that this policy got backing by the Liberal Democrats is, like Jane said, it is a small L liberal policy. Um, and I think that it was very much passed at a time where we were looking at the really, really investigating um, the failures of universal credit, I think, was very, very big in the headlines at the time when this was passed. For me, um, I, as I said, I'm a skeptic and I'm really glad that other people have gone, oh, I'm a little bit, little bit skeptical also. Um, and I think it's because around the time the motion passed, um, I started playing around with various models um, of UBI and to see what the impacts were, how it could work within the UK, but also within the devolved setting of Wales. Um, and I am not too sure how it can and that's why I want a trial because I want to be able to see for myself work out the kinks look at how it does impact our society and how it impacts different people across Wales who currently are being failed by the current system just because the current system is failing of course we have to fix it but I don't know if this is the only solution. Yeah, thank you Dina um, and Reese, do you want to come in there? Yeah thanks Kieran I think um I think as Lib Dems, maybe not everybody, not everybody would agree with us, but I think we like to think that we're pretty challenging the way that we look at problems and we like to look at things in the round and we like to challenge what we think is kind of like the accepted norm. And I think if you look at the last year, which has kind of shone a light on so much that was already wrong in our society and our economy, we really got like a 19th, 20th century system to deal with 21st and 22nd century problems. They're probably a bit too far to think, but you know, we've got old outdated methods to deal with really modern problems and, and problems that are, are, are changing. And if we can't, you know, throw our hat in the ring and say, well, let's try something that, that would, based on the evidence, really change the outlook for a lot of people in this country, then we should definitely be asking those questions and trying those things. Because if we can't do it now, given what we've experienced in the last 12 months, then when are we going to do it? Um, and, and, and it's my view that UBI, coupled with other interventions, isn't, you know, isn't a standalone thing, uh, would really change the outlook for a lot of people, uh, not just in Wales, but across, across the UK. Um, so it answers a lot of those complex problems that, that we're facing. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rhys. Um, I think it segues nicely into our next question, you know, that the current system is clearly failing the people of Wales, um, you know, and following on from what Ian was talking about, you know, at, at this stage, you know, we're simply advocating for a trial. You know, we don't know exactly whether a UBI will work. Um, you know, we're not asking for a full-blown UBI. We're, you know, we're, we're saying trial it because, quite simply, the system that we have now, as you say, is is outdated and it's it's failing and it's not working. Um, so I, you know, I, I completely agree with you there. And then finally, over to to Oliver. Um, you know, do you want to add anything to why the Liberal Democrats have adopted? UBI is a party policy. I can't add a huge amount that's um, really worthy and serious. Um, so I suppose I'll just add something to make people think a bit differently. Is um, I'm a big fan of science fiction movies and uh, particular um, uh, The Fifth Element or um, and all of my favourite sci-fi movies have just left my brain at the moment. Um, but one of the things when I watch those uh, dy sort of dystopian futures is I look at people in um, kind of tiny uh, pods uh, living in this sort of semi-feudal uh, economy, but in the future where people, you've got these tiny numbers of people living in these glistening rich houses and the majority of people living in abject poverty with absolutely no freedom. Uh, and that used to be science fiction. And um, sadly, I think it's becoming more and more uh, the fact of our uh, actual lived experience. Um, so for me, uh, I support UBI um, because I think it's one of the things that stops us sliding into that dystopian future, which seems a bit over the top. We're talking about Senate elections and UBI, and you know maybe people listening will think that that's uh, a lot of exaggeration and a bit of woolliness. But for me, um, it is hugely important that we take action now because that will shape the future that our children and their children will grow up in. Thank you, Oliver. I mean, on the point of fifth element, I'm a big fan, a big Bruce Willis fan is <laughs> one of my top uh, sci-fi films, but um, 
no, I, I, I completely agree with you. We need action now. Um, you know, we, we need to look at the system we have. As we discussed, it's you know it's clearly not working. Um, to Lena, as a skeptic, uh, if I bring this question to you first of all, um, the current system uh, or the current benefit system is, you know, as we discussed, failing the people of Wales. How is universal basic income part of that solution? Well, I think that in a way, yes, it could be part um, of the solution. And it really does depend on um, how much the trial would be giving um, and what the sort of parameters of that, uh, that trial would be. Would it be a benefit that you could get, obviously, um, even if you were not working, you would still be getting that same amount? And of, you know, how much would that amount be? If we're talking about 40 to 50 pounds a week, um, I'm sorry, but that system does not work for asylum seekers. I don't see why it's going to work for people who uh, who, who are not in work. Um, so that's sort of a, in one part of where my scepticism lies. Um, we've also seen that in quite a few of the models, um, you know, where they were giving people slightly higher than that 40 to 50 pound, maybe sort of within the 60 to 70 margin, um, we would be looking at um, a massive sort of, tax rise within um within the government now in wales obviously we've got some taxes devolved not all taxes are devolved so there would be a sort of case there for us to try and get more devolution which i always think is a good thing um, however if we are also looking to reduce things like council tax and people getting annoyed because they cannot pay their council tax how can we then turn around and say but we'd love to raise other taxes much higher i don't see how we can make those two things add up to be honest Okay, thank you, Lena. Well, I won't go into too much detail in, you know, into how we consider or how we've sort of thought about how we could pay for a, a universe basic income, but I think there are lots of interesting ideas, and this will lead into a later question, um, you know, about tying a universal basic income in with a green recovery, perhaps. Um, so, so we'll, we'll touch on it in a second, but if I come to you, Dame, with this question, so you know, the, the current benefit system is failing the people of Wales. Um, how is a UBI part of the solution? Um, so there are many ways that it's part of the solution. Um, universal credit is an abomination. Let's just be frank about it. It's the cruelest system that I can possibly imagine. And we still have sanctions in this country, you know, um, for people who, you know, kind of don't turn up or kind of a... Uh, you know, things have happened to them and they're not able to, um, you know, be at appointments. Um, so we've got to, we've got to have a different system, full stop. We've got to champion that. We've got to push for that. Universal basic income, there are lots of models. Um, I'm, uh, I'm somebody who thinks we can do it in two steps. I think we should go for a very basic universal basic, uh, universal basic income. Um, and trial that. And, and just to be clear, there's a difference for me between a trial and a pilot. I, I think that's just really important to say. A, a pilot is a small scale project to test it out. A trial is actually rolling it out and making sure the implementation of it is uh, working. And I want to see a trial in Wales. I agree with Lena, we do need, we do need those devolved powers um, here to Wales and the Liberal Democrats want home rule. So we want to see that happening. But I, I think there's a lot of merit in us thinking about two-stage process. Um, and we build up a sovereign wealth fund for the second stage, and then we actually pay people more. And just to give you an example, three weeks ago, just tying in with your point, Kieran, about a green recovery, three weeks ago, the seabeds off the, uh, the, the, the coast were up for sale um, for wind farms and actually uh, massive interest. The government is, is due to rake in about 300 million pounds a year from, those, uh, from the sale of those seabeds. Now, where is that money gonna go? My view is it goes to everybody in this country. Uh, we've lost four opportunities over the past 20 years, uh, 30 years, sorry, to actually build up a sovereign wealth fund, including the sale of council houses. Um, and we need to actually say that's a bit like the Alaska model, that is money that should come to every single citizen. So I want that to go towards UBI. And I just want to go back to Lena's point. 
Um, I don't think it's about raising taxes for people who can't afford it, but I do think, and this is part of our policy, we need to raise taxes full stop. We need good public services. We need, we need to have a good education system and actually paying for UBI kind of means that the rich do pay for it. Um, the universality of it is really important for me as well. We have universal benefits at the moment. We have pension, we have um, winter fuel allowance, we have child benefit for up to two children. So it, it's not about making saying somebody deserves it and somebody doesn't. This is, this is for everybody. And it is a system that liberates us and makes sure that we're a more equal society. Thank you, Jane. Um, and Oliver, you got anything to add there? Yeah, so for me, it's about uh, dignity, really. And um, I, I've grown up all my life with a disability and um, was lucky enough and privileged enough to be uh, in a very middle class family uh, where a lot of the things I needed were uh, given. And, uh, you know, I had that support. Um, when I went to university um, in my first year, I kind of suddenly hit that brick wall of what having a disability meant when you lived on your own. Um, I was spending huge amounts of money getting taxis to and from lectures because I couldn't properly walk there. Um, and so I suddenly, all of my maintenance loan and, and any kind of money I was making in my part-time job, uh, it just vanished. So I remember um, I uh, tried to apply for a mobility living allowance as it was then. And it was the most humiliating procedure um, that I've ever had to do. Um, and at the end of it, they decided I wasn't dis disabled and I wasn't entitled to it. And um, I just remember feeling, you know, it took me so long to admit to myself that, you know, that I struggled with my disability. And then to have some sort of faceless bureaucrat tell me uh, that I wasn't disabled enough uh, to get that support. Um, that's always stayed with me um, as a person, um, as a person first, not a politician. So anything that we can do um, that will make that whole process not just better, but completely and utterly redundant uh, would be amazing. So on universal basic income, nobody has to apply for disability living allowance. You know, I think in different models, there are some kind of uplifts and different levels that people with disabilities can, can get. Um, but the idea that the state will say, this is your basic level of income and we will give it to you no matter who you are, uh, I think is massively liberating. And when you look at the people with disabilities throughout Wales uh, who are eking out an existence, you know, on virtually nothing and trying to live lives that cost more than uh, other people, um, I just think it's absolutely the right thing to do. And finally, you know, the current benefit system is massively cost ineffective. We spend billions of pounds on policing and uh, limiting what people can access. Uh, so again, moving to a system where um, you can just give people the money they need, I think makes economic sense as well as moral sense. I, I completely agree with you, Oliver, and you know, you and Jane make very good points. You know, the current system is is, is punitive, um, and it, it sets up people almost to fail. Um, and I think you know, looking at a, a universal basic income, you know, obviously we don't want to make people poorer. And I think we would like to see you know, a basic income um, and, and not strip away you know, other elements like disability and housing for now, um, but certainly have that regular fixed income to ensure that you give people the freedom to live the lives that they want to live. Um, Reese, would you like to add anything to that at all? Difficult to... Um... Follow, follow the you know the personal insight from Oliver, which I think was um, was was great. Thank you for for sharing that. Um, the only other thing that I would talk about is, I suppose, for people who I imagine a lot of people on this call for who a universal basic income is more about disposable disposable cash and that that difference in sense of security. So you know we can also look at UBI in terms of an economic stimulus, in that we know that if people have more money in their pockets, uh, they'll go and spend. Um, and that can only be good after the last year for you know high streets and small business. So yes, absolutely. I mean, everybody else has covered the, the moral arguments and the absolute failures of universal credit. And um, you know, any system that places conditionality on people is never going to to work in the way that I think most of us would want it to. Um, but I think there's an economic argument there in terms of giving people greater spending power, 
that security gives them more spending power and it allows people to you know to shop around um and, and to pump money back into the economy yeah it is, it is a really good point we um, you know, sort of mentioned it at the start um you know poverty this most simplest form is the lack of cash and you know if you give everyone a regular fixed income or cash payment you know, they've got money in their pocket to go spend in their local high streets which is so desperately needed especially as we come out of out of lockdown um, you know we need that stimulus in our economy uh, so i think it's a it's a really good point thank you reese um so come to our third question and we, we've touched on elements but i'd like to um to drill down on it because I think it's really important. I think it's important looking forward to, to the future and the future of Wales. So the sort of first element of the question, I'll come to Reese first of all. Um, so how would Wales pay for a universe basic income? And again, do, do you think there's a way that we can link basic income with a green recovery? Yeah, I think obviously the green economy is, is probably the easiest starting point um, in terms of whether that's through taxation or whether that's through uh, investment in projects that will generate long-term economic benefit. I suppose I'm yet to be convinced that Wales should go it alone on this. I mean, we should be able to trial it ourselves, but I do wonder whether, you know, that the problems with universal credit, in my mind, are most... You know, or, the, prob yeah, the, the, the problems with universal credit basically come down to policy decisions that have been made by Westminster in much of the last five years in the main. Um, if you strip out that policy context, then universal credit should provide what we need for people who are out of work or in need of additional support. So at that point, do you need to devolve the whole set of welfare powers to Wales to be able to administer a UBI? I don't know. I'm yet to be convinced either way on that. Um, and the reason I say that is because as a UK, we have, you know, corporation tax. You've got, you've got the, the scale of income tax and changing the upper thresholds of income tax. Uh, you've got, you've, you've just got that spending power that comes from, a system administered from a central government um, as part of a union. If we're looking at Wales, I don't know how we fund that on a long-term basis at the levels that I would deem sufficient to kind of achieve what we want from a universal basic income. Like I don't think 40, 50, 60 pounds is enough. We should be looking at far more than that to kind of unlock the benefits of a UBI. And can we do that in Wales with the limited powers that we have or even with the powers that we may have uh, if we were to become independent? I don't know is the answer. Uh, but the green economy, you know, in terms of the, some of the solutions that Jane offered in terms of a, a citizen's wealth fund, the green economy seems like a no-brainer a no in terms of what we need in terms of climate emergency, but also in terms of what we need to be able to fund decent public services and the UBI. So yet to be convinced on the tech, technicalities, um, but yeah, green economy seems a, a decent place to start. Yeah, I, mean, I, I completely agree with your points, Reese. I think um, you know, if we can tie this in you know, with a green recovery, it, it, it's a win-win. And, you know, I'm from Swansea and we've seen our proposed tidal lagoon um, you know, taken away from us by a, a Tory government, which probably boiled down to politics in the end. And, and you just think, you know, if we took advantage of you know the power that we have in this country with you know with tidal power and wind and solar etc you know, what, what this could do if we fed this into you know the likes of a sovereign wealth fund um just on that point you know from from everyone listening tonight if you, you know if you have questions please feed them into uh, into the chat and then hopefully the the, the team in the network will uh, will be able to feed them to us then as well um okay so oliver do you want to come in on that last question so how would UBI, how would Wales pay for UBI rather? And, and, and do you think this could be linked with, with the green recovery? So um, yes, to the second question about the green recovery, I think that's really uh, crucial. You know, and it's one of the reasons why I'm trying not to be party political, um, but this might be the first bit I do. Um, it's one of the reasons I'm really proud of uh, the Lib Dem manifesto for Wales about having £1 billion um, invested in green technologies. I think that will absolutely 
um, help um, create um, a green economy that will help generate some of that sovereign wealth fund. Um, in terms of how would Wales pay for a UBI, I think, you know, there is issues with the devolution settlement and a lot of the um, kind of macroeconomic uh, levers that are controlled by Westminster. Uh, and I think a lot of that may need to change. So in general, <laughs> um, and this is where I might seem quite blasé or casual, and I don't mean to be, um, but I think some of it is a change in mindset. When you look at any kind of traditional response to economic uh, downturns, you know, the Keynesian economic approach is to um, absolutely invest, creating that virtuous cycle of public investment, which leads to public spending, which leads to uh, private economy, uh, private business uh, increasing, which, you know, generates more and more money. Um, so what I would uh, suggest is we can't not afford to do it, if that makes sense, if that sentence makes sense, in the sense that we are coming out of uh, an incredible economic shock uh, to our country. Um, we are facing huge numbers uh, of people unemployed and there will be jobs that no longer exist as a result of economic factors that have been massively accelerated, perhaps 10, 20, 30 years faster than we thought they would. So, you know, there will be people in the service industry who will not have jobs to go back to. So we can't afford to dither and uh, kind of leave people without those jobs. So what can we do? Well, UBI at a decent high level, I, I don't I don't support a UBI, which is 40 or 50 quid a week. You know, that's just not, you know, if we're going to do it, let's do it properly. Um, for me, it's about giving people the choice, uh, whether they um, have, uh, whether they work for a little bit more money or whether they uh, use that time to invest uh, in something different. You know, my dream, let's, let's put it like this, my dream of a Wales with UBI is that people have enough to live on. Uh, if people need a bit more money, they take some hours working. If people want to develop a new language, maybe um, speak Welsh, I'd love to have the time to learn to speak Welsh. Um, I, I could do that. Maybe people want to set up their own business. Maybe people want to become a writer. Maybe people want to play music. And all of that, not to be uh, particularly um, reductive about this, all of that has a financial consequence. So if you are a writer, you produce art, which creates Wales as a centre of creative industry. If you set up a business, you are generating um, finances and resources for the economy. So it's very easy to get really tied up in, oh, can we afford UBI? Well, actually, looking at the world where we're in now, I think we have to afford it and we have to do it quickly. I think you're absolutely right here, Holloway. No, the question is, can we not afford UBI almost, isn't it? Um, and as, as you've touched on, it gives you that freedom of choice, you know, the choice to go back and retrain to go to university that freedom if you're trapped in a job you know, that you don't want to work in anymore gives you that ability to you know, go and take that leap to be self-employed or to create your own business you know, I, I completely agree now um lena is our you know, sort of ubi skeptic on the panel um you know, do, do you think that we can tie or do you think this is a good opportunity i suppose to tie ubi in uh, ubi in with with the green recovery well, I, I think that tying UBI in with the green recovery is a bit of a mute point because it wouldn't be a green recovery if you weren't considering our recovery in a holistic sense. Um, so obviously, if UBI is your path to go down in terms of trialing that within Wales, of course, it has to be a part of the green recovery. But so does everything else. So mute point on that one. Um, but I, what I would say in terms of UBI, and I think um, Oliver and Rus touched on this a little bit, um, but it's in terms of, obviously, I pointed out that most trials have involved sort of 40 to 50 pounds and then modelling sort of 60 to 70 at a push. Now, if you want to have a UBI that is, you know, slightly higher, more encompassing, then my next question becomes, what then um, happens to other forms of support? So for example, support for, um, uh, you know, buying homes, or maybe if you've got, uh, you know, you know, disability support, that sort of thing, does that then get tacked on to UBI? Are we going to have enough money for that? Because actually, if we were to set UBI at even £60 a week, which is not a lot, um, per what Reese and Oliver have said, um, we're looking at an extra £81 billion in money that we need to find 
um, as a devolved Wales, which we don't currently have the tax raising powers for, like I said, we need to get those powers. But I'm a bit concerned by that because I think that there's so many other things in Wales that we could be pushing that money towards. Um, and whilst UBI sounds great, trial sounds great, and I would completely support having a trial, I am not sure if, um, if this trial would necessarily be balanced in the way that, um, you know, where you live, taking into uh, account where, where you live, what your background is, that sort of thing, um, because it is obviously universal. Um, so I, I have a lot of questions around that. And how do we then score that with, for example, if we scrap certain types of perhaps, I don't know, housing benefits, how do we score that with young people moving out of Wales who already don't want to be paying too much tax? And we're now asking them to stump up for UBI on a national level. How, how do I square that? How do we square that? Um, I put that to you, the, the UBI enthusiast, as I am the UBI sceptic. Can I come back on that, Kieran? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, please. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely get that people do want to know the detail um, uh, and they want to know how much per week everybody's going to get. And if you wait for the Liberal Democrat conference in October, we'll be putting a model forward. I think right now the COVID pandemic, you know, means that things are changing, things are shifting. But I just want to throw in one more thing which is that there is evidence to suggest that UBI actually reduces stress and therefore mental health services uh, don't have to be so overloaded. It increases educational attainment. So that means we have a better educated and hopefully uh, better skilled um, population. And the third thing, which I think is really interesting is it actually reduces physical illness. So it actually reduces hospital admissions. Now, what we, what's never been factored into any model whatsoever are the costs of public services from an, uh, an income that everybody gets every week. And I, I think people can think about that as well. I mean, you know, we'll never put a price on it because, you, you, you know, that's a really difficult one unless you have a trial that's 10, 20 years long. But, but I think we do need to think about that and think actively, uh, you know, what, what our services um, will actually be reduced by. And there's lots of models and there's lots of trials that demonstrate that. So, yeah, it's just something else for people to think about when they're thinking about the, the costs of it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And you know, just coming back to one of the points that Lena raised, um, you know, we don't profess to be the, the experts at um, UBI Lab Wales, but I think if we were to have any input on what a pilot would look like in Wales, then you know I think we would like it to be led by you know for example the the Welsh Deprivation Index. You know ultimately this is about um, alleviating poverty. So I think we want to be led by the poorest areas um, in Wales. And I think Jane makes some some again really really valid points. Um, yes, there's an obvious cost to introducing a, a basic income. Um, but what are we going to achieve by introducing that, you know, physical and mental well-being? I mean, how much do we pay, um, you know, in, in supporting people, you know, through these services? And, you know, all of the trials thus far show, um, you know, significant reduce, or a, a reduction, um, you know, in, in mental health problems and physical health problems. So I think it's a, it's a really good point, Jade. And sorry, Oliver, um, you've got your hand up. Yeah, sorry, I, did, I just raised it because I know it's hard to keep track of people in Zoom. And I'll try and be quick because... Um, I know I, I really want to hear from some people as well, um, but also this is a really crucial question, I think, and it's where it's where proponents and opponents of UBI often uh, kind of disagree. Um, I'm going to mention it because I spent an hour reading through the 1948 Hansard debate of the NHS, um, which, um, as if I didn't have better things to do um, with my life, I don't because we're in lockdown, but... Um, and in that, it was really interesting, some of the um, kind of arguments people used against the formation uh, of um, the NHS. People were talking about it um, being unaffordable, about driving us towards a socialist state, um, about it uh, devaluing healthcare. And the worst example of contribution to the debate um, was someone who said, um, I've just taken notes, which is why I'm looking away, um, people in poverty needed better education before we trusted them with healthcare. I'm slightly summarising, but that was definitely one of the views. And um, I'm just really 
caught by that because um, UBI, we're hearing the same arguments. You know, can we trust people with money? Uh, you know, is it affordable to just give people money? You know, I think if we framed it as a national uh, living wage, <laughs> you know, actually, would it feel quite so scary um, to people? You know, if you when I think about myself and, you know, some of my friends who've worked in the service industry have really struggled living hand to mouth um, for money. Um, that stress and that pressure that, that pe those people hold, uh, which is predominantly younger people, but not, not limited to younger people, is absolutely crippling. And it stops people from living their life. It stops people from... this term because it makes it really um clinical but the precariat which is something that you know uh, academics use to describe people who are really struggling i don't know why we don't just say people who are really struggling um you know that for me is what ubi means is that you can reach out to people and say take some of that weight off you know have a breath and breathe and you know enjoy the same type of life that some other people in our country can so I'll just finish really quickly. You know, one of the, um, I think it was an Iron Bevan, which is not often that a Lib Dem quotes him, but I'm a massive fan. Um, I, he, he described the NHS as the most civilised step any country has ever taken. Um, and I think uh, UBI could be the next most civilised step that any country has ever taken. And if we had allowed ourselves to be crippled by all of these debates around the NHS, we wouldn't be having treatment uh, for everyone free at the point of delivery. So let's just get it done. Thank you, Oliver. Well, we say it could be our generation's NHS. Yeah, so I, I can agree with you more. Um, Jane, uh, conscious we've got 15 minutes left. So we've got a couple of questions, set questions left, and I'm hoping we can bring it back to the, uh, to the floor then. So um, Jane, if I bring this to you, uh, as UK Labour drifts closer to the centre-right of politics, will advocating for you know, a radical policy, should we say, such as UBI, help the Liberal Democrats gain more seats in the Senate elections this May? Who knows? Um, it's up to the Welsh people. Um, but when, well, I'll speak for myself. I'm a candidate and I'm the leader of the Welsh Party, and I want to make it brief because I do want to hear from people here. Um, I think we're doing the right thing. Um, we, we're not necessarily after votes. That would be a nice extra. Uh, but the Liberal Democrats are not known for um, kind of getting lots of votes for policies that can sometimes be popular or unpopular. You know, we were the only national party that stood for Europe and look where that left us in, in December 2019. Um, but I think this is the right thing, just as I thought that, uh, and still do, st staying in Europe uh, was the right thing. So, um, yeah. Let's see what happens. It's up to the Welsh people. Uh, we've got lots of other things that we we, we want to put at the forefront as well of uh, what we're saying to people. Well, you're certainly leading the way. Thank you, Jane. Does anyone else from the panel want to come in on that question? We can move swiftly on, if not. <laughs> Okay, um, so the, the final set question this evening, then we can go to the floor. Um, so can Wales realistically implement a policy such as UBI with the current state of devolution? And what do you say to those who believe implementation of a UBI can only be achieved through an independent Wales? Have we come to you, Rhys, first of all? Well, basically the answer is no, isn't it? We can't, we can't do it in the current framework. Um, and the, you know there are ways in which we could we could do it in a uh, in a federal system, um, but the question is whether we can um, whether that cuts with what else we want to be able to achieve as a as a country and, and through the Welsh government. Um, I don't know whether I mean I'm I probably shouldn't say this because it's not party policy, but I'm undecided on the independence question. You know. You know, depending on what Scotland does, I think we're in a very difficult position. Um, but I do wonder whether, you know, social security should be held at Westminster. If it's a single, as I said earlier, if it's a single direct payment, you take the politics and the policy out of it. If it's a single direct payment, which is, you know, decided by a, an independent board on what that is, 
you can't then repeal it because there's such a public support for it as with the NHS, you know, does it need to be devolved? Does it need to be delivered by Westminster? Does it need to be delivered by Welsh Government, sorry? And do we need to be independent to do that? Um, I kind of think it's maybe conflating two, two different debates um, about delivery rather than the, you know, the, the proving concept. Um, but no, we can't do it in the current system. You know, we're advocates as a party of further devolution, a federal state. Um, and I think it can't be it can't it can't be done in the current framework. But there are ways in which we could do it. But I think the independence thing is a bit of a red herring. Well, yes, and you know it just shows politics and life generally is moving at light speed at the moment. I think I was speaking with Jonathan from UBL Lab Wales back in November, and I was very much on the fence. Or in fact, I thought we had to remain as part of um, the UK or wider UK. Um, whereas I'm certainly indie curious shall we say now i think um you know, further devolution is needed to achieve you know the likes of a, a basic income um from the panel would anyone else like to come in on that question oliver or jane or pina yeah i'm I i'm just happy like... to give a quick one. Oh, my bad jane sorry <laughs> no i'd um... just like to hear from the panel at the the other people so because we've yep. got a few people with their hands up and uh... yeah we have Sorry, Lena, it's just- I'll a... be very quick, don't okay. worry. Um, I think that, um, as Rhys said, it is a bit of a red herring now. It's no secret to any of the panel members and possibly some, some of the guests that I am probably the a, a big fan of devolving anything possible that I could to Wales, I'd do it in an instant. You know, minute you get me into the Zenith, I'll be there devolving everything right, left and centre. However, I think that with welfare, it's a very different question because if anything, there is a lot of merit in looking at economies of scale. And so actually, I think that if you wanted a UBI lab, uh, a UBI trial in Wales or in anywhere in the UK, you'd have to be in a federal system because there wouldn't be the scale to be able to do it within Wales by itself. Yes, from a power standpoint, it would sure you could have an argument for uh, an independent Wales might be a bit quicker at implementing it, but you're only going to be stuck on the 40 and 50 pound a week sort of UBI. And we've already heard from the other panel members that that's not what we're looking for here. We're looking for something a bit more dignified and a bit more, um, a bit higher realistically. So yeah, I think a federal UK is, this is a great sort of, you know, bandwagon for a federal UK is that we'd have an economy of scale to be able to implement a trial such as this. Thank you, Dina. So, um, fair point from Jane. Um, I think it's a really interesting question for from Dave Beck, but I'll come to you in a second. But Patricia, you've got your hand up. Patricia can. Do you want to come in? Can we can we unmute Patricia? Johnny or Sam from the network, if we have that ability to unmute. Uh, I can request unmuting, but Patricia will just have to press the button to unmute herself. Yeah, I'm just going to say I've done the same. Not quite as tech savvy as some of the, some of the members of the network. Nor was Patricia, by the looks of things, possibly. <laughs> well, possibly while well, well, Patricia tries to come to that, I think um, Dave Beck, you've, you've got an interesting question which I'll put to the panel. And if you want to put your hands up from the panel, you want to come in on this. Um, so, as someone who previously lived in Wales and now living in Manchester, what would stop me from potentially and other million and millions of others rather? flocking across the border to live in Wales, I presume if we manage to introduce a basic income here and England don't. Would anyone like to come in on that? Oliver? So what's going to stop people flooding across the border and taking uh, our basic income? <laughs> Welcome to Wales. It, it's open for everyone and I hope when you come and you get your universal basic income that you enjoy a nice free economy where you can make decisions, live happy, free and uh, build a good life here. And Wales is a beautiful country. Uh, I hope you enjoy learning the language and the people we've got here and welcome. Thank you. I, I agree. Uh, I don't know. Sorry. I, okay, Patricia. No, thank Patricia, you. Come in. Yeah. I uh, very, very sorry, I've come into the meeting late, um, but uh, it, UBI has something that I, is something that I've been really interested in for years. Um, I've lived in poverty for most of my working life, and I really feel that um, myself amongst other minions or millions <laughs> um, are gonna, really gonna benefit from this, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've lived a life 
uh, I, I struggle all the time for money. Um, I'm working now, uh, but I work long shifts uh, in a care home, like many others, the minimum wage. Um, I've spent many years on, on benefits. Uh, yeah, and struggled most of my life. I'm 63 now. And I just cannot wait to retire, but I can't afford to. Um, so yeah, this this is I think UBI is going to be really good for people like us. Um, Thank you. I don't know if you can still hear me. <laughs> yes, yes, no, we can. It's re really powerful words. Thank you. I think the bottom line is it will give people the dignity they deserve. You know, the dignity to to be able to retire comfortably, and you know pay for their basic needs, you know, pay for a roof over their head and, you know, food on their table and be able to turn the heating on, you know, all, all these basic rights. Um, you know, so thank you, Patricia. That was, um, that was fantastic. I'm, I'm going to try and get another question from the floor quickly. I think if we uh, direct this to Oliver, since you've spoken so eloquently this evening about disability. Um, so we've got a question from the floor. I'm sorry, I don't know who it's come from. I know of disabled people who are worried that they'll be worse off on UBI. How can you reassure them that they would that that wouldn't be the case? I think that for me is a crucial part of the model. Um, so I can't reassure people directly that depending on what model is adopted, that will definitely be the case. Uh, any model I would ever vote for or support um, would absolutely take that into account. You know, the whole point, the principles, I always go back to the principles of what UBI is. It's about dignity. It's about freedom to choose. It's about living a life free of fear of poverty um, or illness. You know, that is the crucial kind of liberal principles of the value of UBI. Um, you can't hold true to those principles unless you include um people with disabilities in that, uh, people with mental health problems, any kind of neurodiversity, uh, people from um, other races, genders, you know, UBI has to work for everyone. Um, so I can't reassure you on every single model, um, but certainly any UBI I would ever support would have that at the heart of it. Thanks, so it'd be interesting to take Jane's um, steel yeah, on, um, of course. on Jane. Yeah, thank you. Um, any model that I would support, the same as Oliver, it has to have a component for additional needs. Um, uh, and that, that includes uh, needs such as uh, disabilities, includes uh, illnesses as well, um, people who have uh, prolonged enduring illness, but also people who have specific periods of illness as well. So absolutely, it, it is you know, universal basic is, income is what it says on the tin. Um, and anything, any other additional needs that people have, we have to make sure that they have the money to be able to live with dignity. Uh, and that has to be funded. So that's the model. Those are the sorts of models that we're looking at. Yeah, I think, thanks, Jade. I think obviously the bottom line is you, you, you don't want to make people poorer, do you? Um, so you have a basic income but you don't want to remove potentially other rights you know such as disability allowances does anyone want to come in on that from the panel what does anyone anyone have anything to add from the audience if you want to put a hand up as we are coming almost to the end of our conversation this evening just see if i can find any questions from the group chat okay we've got a question here would UBI totally replace universal credit? And if so, and to give the freedoms that Oliver talks about, wouldn't the rates need to be much higher than the 40 to 50 or even the 70 to 80 figures talked about earlier? So what level of UBI is required? Again, would any of our panel members like to come in on that? Shall I come in on that one? Yes, yeah, please say, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I, I think there's two points. Again, I go back to, you know, it's about the principle here and we are working up a model and I know that may feel like a complete get out, but actually the important thing is that we do, we have to be flexible right now. The second thing for me is that there is, there are loads of models, loads of research out there and um, 
they they do pitch it at a, at a rate there is a there is one model the the kind of phased in partial model which actually is within the envelope of what the benefit system is right now so it, it it's no different and it puts the pension level at exactly the same uh, it puts the uh, child benefit level as exactly the same. It's within the the envelope, but we must we mustn't leave it at that. We must really uh, aspire for more because this is about us. Actually, oh, I'm not going to use the word, but uh, but it is the only word. It is about the leveling up. It is about making sure that we have the opportunity for people to be able to to live um, and to have those basic needs met. And, and and we have to go for more. And we, you know, the, the kind of ideas that we have then is it's within the funding envelope of the benefit system and with our sovereign wealth fund, which is built up, which we're starting to build up from now. 300 million pounds a year is going into the coffers from the sale of seabeds. And there's lots of other sales going on right now. The land registry is going to be sold off. There's lots of other things that are being that we want to go into a sovereign wealth fund, which is for everybody. So that's how we would start then to model. We'd start to look at what's in that fund and we'd start the modeling from there. But right now with COVID, it's a bit of a diff diff difficult situation. Although I would argue that actually we if we, we have got a system of emergency UBI right now, we've got furlough, we've got the furlough money. We've got thankfully a, a paltry 20 pounds extra on top of uh, universal credit. We've actually got universal basic income operating right now. So don't be afraid to say that we can afford it because we can afford it. If you put your mind to it, just like Anair and Bevan did in 1946, despite the Conservatives voting it down on 21 occasions and doctors saying they didn't want the NHS, he passed it through and it is about political will and it is about mind over matter or mind over money and saying this is the principle we want for people in Wales whether you live in Wales whether you want to come and move to Wales just that's what it, it is about it's a vision for a future Wales and that's what excites me. Thank you Jane absolutely I think we found that money tree during Covid didn't we um, I know that we you know, I think um, oh, oh go on Patricia I think you um, you've got your hand up would you like to uh, have the final word this evening? If we can um, just send you a request to un unmute Patricia. Yes. Can you hear me now? I we can. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. No, I would just like to say a big thank you to, ev to everyone for, for organizing this. Um, and yeah, it's just, well, I think it's just giving a lot of um, poor people more hope, you know? Um, yeah, I, I do. I think it's, it's something that's definitely worth fighting for. I, I, we are worth fighting for, all as individuals and as a whole. You know, we're, we're worth fighting for. And um, yeah, so yeah, it's just, you know, I think it's just so important. Hello? Yeah. No, you're, yeah. you're absolutely right. Sorry, Patricia. You're absolutely right. Now, I'm afraid we have come to the end of our hour slot this evening. So just to um, echo Patricia's words, thank you so much to all of our panellists this evening. You've, um, you've been fantastic and you've put some really eloquent points forward. Um, as one final plug, guys, and you know, picking up from Patricia left off, um, you know, we all can help to keep the conversation going you know, by you know, sharing on Facebook and Twitter and all the social media platforms and you know, speaking with our family and our friends um, and by signing our pledge you know as an individual as we discussed we can encourage our local candidates to sign the pledge you know and, and thank you so again to all our panel members for already having their name on that pledge this evening um, so we'll end it there guys thank you all for for joining us this evening thank you so much everybody Nostar. Yeah, I am not